Chris with DFW Airstream and this is your 16 Caravelle. Like always, we'll start here with this front solar guard. Reach up on either side, level it out. That's gonna let you open the front window. Remember this dinette window opens outward and the solar guard is blocking it. So before you can open the window from inside the trailer, you will need to free it. Always recommend washing the rubber gaskets with soap and water solution and using a silicone spray to keep the window from sticking. If the window is stuck, don't force open it from the inside. Come outside with an old credit card or your finger, free it from the bottom edge of this gasket, and at that point it'll be safe to open from the inside. Opening that center solar guard will let you open the side solar guards. Remember, the only reason you want to open these side solar guards is just to wash the window that's behind it. The screws that hold it shut are actually T-shaped anchors, but you'll use a Phillips head screwdriver. You'll give them a quarter turn. They'll come away from the trailer. Make sure you've got a hold of them. If it's windy outside, you don't want the wind to fling it around. Just wipe it down and re-secure it. We will talk about the batteries. They're in this box down here behind the propane cover. This unit comes with dual AGM batteries. Remember, AGM batteries are sealed, so you don't have to worry about checking the water level. Inside here, you'll find the fuse for the tongue jack and the fuse for the solar plug. The solar plug next to the spare tire handle. Spare tires mounted up front, underneath. After that, we've got your propane. This unit will come with 20 pound propane bottles. They will already be full on your day of delivery. In between the bottles, you've got an automatic regulator. So if you've got both bottles open, when that first bottle runs empty, that regulator will automatically switch over to the second bottle. It switches internally, but when it does, it reduces the pressure by about a third. What I would recommend you guys do is just run one bottle open at a time. So that way when that first bottle runs empty, you actually have to come out here and physically shut it and open the second bottle. And when you do, I want you to take the regulator and rotate it so that the little pointer, this little pointer right here, is pointing at the bottle that you just opened. So it'll rotate from one side over to the other. Out front, we've got your tongue jack. It's power. There is a light. If it's not working, there is a manual crank that comes with the trailer that you can fit down here underneath the bubble level. And you'll be able to manually crank it on or off the tow vehicle. But if it's not working, check that fuse in the battery compartment first. The tongue jack is wired directly to the batteries. Come around the corner here. I do want to point out real quick before we go to the side, on this side of the battery box, you've got an external propane fitting. Feeds off your onboard bottles. Pre-regulated up to 25,000 BTUs. You can use that to run a little camping stove, maybe even a little space heater. Coming around the corner, I want to mention the gross vehicle weight and tire pressure sticker. All three tires on this unit are going to be an 80 PSI tire, and that includes your spare. You want to maintain that pressure for best towing and also best tire wear. Next to that, we've got the fill port for the fresh water tank. So when you're adding water to the trailer to bring with you when you're boondocking, you want to do so through here. This is just your standard gravity port. Stick your water hose in there and fill it up. The gauge inside can be set so that you can monitor the fresh tank as you're filling it. If you lose track of it while you're filling it and you overfill the fresh tank, the overflow comes out of the vent port and not somewhere randomly inside the trailer. The drain on this unit is going to be located underneath the dinette bench, so we'll show you that when we get inside. Coming up here, we've got the back side of the vent hood. This is over the range in the galley area. These little tabs are keeping that door shut. You've got to push them up to allow that door to vent when you turn the fan on. Make sure you've got this door secure when you're towing. It's plastic and it's going to flap as you're heading down the road. Over time, that may cause some damage. Coming all the way down to the bottom underneath, we've got your storage tube for your sewer hose. This black tube will hold up to 15 feet worth of collapsible sewer hose. Again, that one's just for storage. You're going to connect that further back when you're actually doing the waste clean out. We've got your city water connection here. So this is where you connect your water hose when you're at your camping site for your on-demand water. You wanna remember that an Airstream will have a built-in water pressure regulator. It is a 50 PSI regulator, so there's no need to add one to the water hose itself. And the city water will directly feed every faucet in the trailer, bypassing the fresh water system. And that includes the outside shower, which is right below it. Now, if you are boondocking, as in not connected to the city water connection. To get water pressure here, you will have to turn on the onboard water pump. This unit has an on-demand water heater. So if the trailer is turned on and one of your propane bottles is open, when you open the hot water valve, you'll get hot water out here within 10 or 15 seconds. Next to the city water connection is the black tank cleanout valve. There is just one waste tank on a 16-foot trailer, combination black and gray. 
This port will fill that, so that way when you're flushing it out, you can add water back to it. You can actually look through the galley window here and see the tank monitor. We will recommend that you set the tank monitor before you start filling and emptying the black tank so you don't overflow it. And I'll show you how to do that when we get inside. Next, we have your on-demand water heater. This is a propane-only water heater. There's no actual drain plug and there's no add node rod, so for you guys, it'll be basically maintenance free. The default for the water heater is on, so if the trailer is powered, the water heater is also already powered, but being on demand, you've got to draw water through it to get it to operate. Outside, you're going to find a master disconnect switch and a pressure relief valve. We'll use those when we are winterizing the unit. We'll turn that back on right there. The thing you got to remember about the water heater is there will be a propane exhaust coming out of this port right here to about a foot, so make sure you don't block it with anything flammable. This is also the exhaust for the furnace. One thing I always recommend is buying the little screens and covering your furnace exhaust, especially if you live down here in the south. Um, these exhausts have been known to be susceptible to mud dauber wasps. Next to that, we've got your camp power. 30 amp service if you want to run the air conditioner. You can always plug it into your standard wall plug. That's going to be a typically 15 or 20 amp service. Can't run the air conditioner on that, but it will allow you to keep the batteries charged, get the refrigerator cold. Basically run everything in there except the refrigerator, I'm sorry, the, refri the air conditioner. If you want that air conditioner, you need to make sure you plug into a 30 amp service. This trailer will come with a 25 foot shore cord. That's what this is right here. These smart plugs, they have caps for the end right here. So there'll be a little black dust cap keeping the dirt and debris out of it. Make sure you pull that off before you plug it in. All you gotta do is plug it right in. Below that, we've got a cable and satellite port. These ports are labeled cable and satellite and they do perform different functions. So we'll talk again about that once we get inside. All the way down at the bottom, we've got one of the four studs for your four stabilizer jacks. Remember, these jacks are just designed to prevent the trailer from rocking. They're not lifting or leveling jacks. So you need to make sure that you have already leveled the trailer before you draw them down and that you have disconnected the tow vehicle. What you do not want to do is operate the tongue jack at the front with the stab jacks down. You will put too much pressure on one end or another and possibly cause them to collapse. You'll notice that we've got them all down right now. The trailer itself is going to come with a manual crank. I'll just use this three quarter inch on a drill for the demo, right up or right back down. Always give it just a touch of pressure once it hits the ground to make sure that when you go inside and walk around, one of them doesn't come up off the ground. Heading back just a little bit, we've got your waste clean out. There is a light down here in case you've got to connect your hose at night. Hose goes right here, one valve on this unit just a gate valve, pull it out and the stuff comes out. I do recommend you fill the tank mostly full if it's not already there when you're doing your waste clean out and you will need to fill and empty it about three times until it's clean. So flush it out every time you use it by filling and emptying it. When it's clean, close the valve here, let water back in until the tank monitor goes from zero to whatever you see the first number be, might be four, might be six, so that way as you add your chemical into the toilet, there's some water in the tank for it to dissolve and diffuse into. Let me grab an awning tool. We'll start pulling the awnings out. The awning on this side of the trailer is going to have a little hook style travel latch. You just need to rotate that out of the way. Grab the strap, pull it away from the trailer, capture it right here on this hook. You can always use the tool to put it away if you need to. You want to capture it just like so. Bring it in until it connects with the little aluminum cover. Let it snap in those last few inches so it's nice and tight. And remember to re-engage your travel latches if you're leaving your camping site. Just rotate this one right back into place. We'll come around the back here. Before I pull the awning out back here, I do want to mention that there is a backup camera with a microphone. It is a one-way microphone going from the camera to the monitor. So you want to bear that in mind when you're backing up and parking. The awning on the rear does not have a latch, so just grab the strap and pull it out. The stalks on either side that hold it in place have to be rotated all the way around and attached to this little catch right there. They are too long to run this direction, so they must run all the way around. On the back, you'll take the strap and roll it up. There's a little bit of Velcro here at the top. It's going to hold it right out of your view. I like to take these stalks and hide them behind the little acorn nuts here to keep them from flapping around as I'm towing it. 
Below that, we've got your one external storage compartment. This one will be considered secure and dry. It's got a dual rubber gasket, doing a good job of keeping the water out. They can be locked with a key. The little 16-footer will come with quite a few plastic tubs back here. And again, the light inside is manual, so when you're done stowing your stuff, make sure you reach over here on the side, turn that light off before you close the door. Below that, you've got your bumper or trunk storage compartment. This one is considered to be a wet storage. It will close, but it's not gonna seal completely. Things inside here will get damp. They're not gonna flood. So just bear that in mind when you stow your stuff in here. Little compression latches to keep it closed. Folks, we'll come around here to the road side. I'm sorry, the curb side. I'm gonna shut the door just for a little better visual when we pull the awning out. The awning on this side is gonna have the same little hook style travel latch. Disengage that. And then on either side, you'll have to unscrew these. Once you've got it unsecured, grab the strap. This one's very important that you pull it away from the trailer so you're not scratching it. I like to pull it until I can get a hold of the strap and get rid of the tool so it doesn't slip. Pull it out until you see the, the little flap drop out here. Grab one of the arms, place it up here on the head, and then push it forward to lock it, just like so. We'll come down here, we'll do the same thing, except this time what I'm gonna do, instead of being on the inside underneath, the other way that you can do it is to grab it from the outside and just kind of lean back. At this point, we can start to extend it. You've got four of these little notches and you can do up to two at a time before the arms begin to bind. So we'll do two here. One and two and three. Now folks, these awnings are sunshades. They are not designed to be out in the weather. If it starts to rain, starts to pour, close them. Before we close this one, I do want to mention that there is a little LED light strip across the top there that you can dim by holding your finger on the button. Tap to turn it off. We'll put the awning away. It's just the reverse of bringing it out. One thing you want to notice is I'm not allowing this to draw all the way down. I will stop it at each notch so that way it doesn't come off slamming all the way down and bind. So one notch at a time. Once you're at the bottom, pull here to release the upper arm. Fold it, whoa, fold it back. Same thing over here. Make sure you've got a hold of it until you can get to the strap. If you like. Use the tool to return the awning. And then re-engage the travel latches. The hook style one just rotates back in place. Pinch the arms together, toss this up into the little slot. And tighten it down. Now the one over here, we can just stand in the entryway and re-secure. All right. So we'll talk about the entry door next. You've got a pair of doors here. You've got a screen door and a main entry door. One thing you never want to do is slam this main entry door onto the screen door. Over time you will flatten it out and it will no longer sit properly. Always close them together. You got a deadbolt at the bottom and a latch above where the handle is. Separate keys for both. 
This door has to be closed firmly. I always tell folks to close it deliberately. You do have a thick rubber gasket here and the latch has two engagement points. So if it's not closed hard enough, that second engagement point will not secure. A lot of times you can just push it shut, but Airstream will tell you to go ahead and slam it. I'll tell you to go ahead and close it deliberately. <clears throat> Below that, we've got the step. This is the easiest step to use in the whole industry. You kick it in and you pull it out. That's it. As we come inside, I always like to mention that there is a fire extinguisher right here by the door just in case you need it. Moving further in, we're going to find a drawer here underneath the dinette bench. Come on in here, bud. We got the wall right around the corner. We're going to have the light switches. The two with the dimmer are the awning on the right and the main ceiling on the left. Hold your finger on it to dim, tap it to turn it on and off. This is just the step light outside. And then this is the master power right here at the bottom. Remember, that's going to shut everything in the trailer off. However, if you are plugged in at your storage site, it will continue to charge whether this button is on or off. One thing you want to remember is the dimmer lights do not come back on automatically. They do have to be returned. Up in this compartment, you'll find the radio. It's a 12 volt radio. The radio can be paired with your phones. We've got a plug for the auxiliary port on the radio and a plug for the HDMI port on the television. That HDMI port coincides with HDMI 1 on the one TV in this unit. There's also a hot inverter plug up there if you want to run a DVD player or some kind of streaming device. Dinette table, lift up here, push down on the table leg tab to secure it and pull those out of the wall to make the bed. When you're making the bed, you want to pick up the cushions. Allow it all the way down. Take the short ends off here. There's your dinette bed. I will recommend that when you tow the unit, you tow with it either in the bed position or at least with the table down on the cushions. You'll see as I pick this back up, that when you've got the table leg down, it's gonna bounce. Over time, you might get a little scuff mark on your floor. So I will suggest you tow with it at least down like this, if not all the way into the bed position. Now I'm gonna take this bench apart here and pull the cushion out of the way. We're gonna find our fresh water tank. So 12 volt distribution, water pump, solar control panel. The drain for the fresh tank is actually in here. We'll look down right next to the side of the tank here and find a little white valve surrounded by wires. Parallel that valve with the water line and it will drain out of the floor of the, tra the trailer. Of course, we got the vent hood here. Remember the little flap on the outside? It's also got a light. Below that, the range. To get the range to light, push down on the knob for the igniter. Turn it for the gas. All the way at the bottom, we've got the refrigerator. This is an electric refrigerator. So it's running on the house batteries. Knob here on the side is your on off. Zero is off, seven is fully on. You've got a five or six hour window for it to get completely cold with it completely cold and no power stays cold for five or six hours as long as you keep the door shut but it runs on the house battery so if you leave the switch by the entry on the refrigerator will stay powered while you're heading down the road got a little travel latch right there it's going to help keep that door shut back up here light switch for the galley and then on the wall you have your solar monitor panel your sea level panel and your water heater remember on the sea level it's going to give you the battery reading in voltage so that's telling you 13 and a half volts. Water tanks are a percentage. So this will tell you that the fresh tank is roughly 40% full and that the black tank is empty.
and that the black tank is also 40% full. <laughs> now the switch here is where you'll turn on the water pump. So on demand water pump is going to pressure up and stop. It's not going to come back on until you create a demand. What we'll do is we'll use it to test the water heater. It's an on-demand water heater, so we've got a temperature range of 124 down to 96. Most commercial faucets are set at 118 to 120. To get it to work, you just got to create a demand. Turn the water on. We'll see a little indicator when it's working, and once it lights, you'll see a flame here in between them. And once the temperature crosses about 110, it should already be on its way to pretty hot. One thing I will recommend you do not do is use the faucet to set the temperature. If you use the faucet to set the temperature, what happens is the water heater turns off. And then the water goes cold. What you want to do with this on-demand water heater is use this control panel to set the temperature. So for example, if you're going to shower, run that water down to about 110, turn the faucet on full, and you'll be able to enjoy water at a consistent temperature without it spiking and going cold. Right, we'll leave that on for a second. Now, silverware caddy right below the galley. Microwave below that. On this unit, it's just going to be a simple microwave. Remember, it's only going to work when you're plugged into your shore service. There is an onboard inverter, but it's only 1,000 watts, and there's not enough power there to power the microwave. Bathroom here. In the bathroom, you've got a little manual vent fan that you could push up and turn on. Use that when you're showering or using the restroom. Shower knobs here, toilet, flushed with the lever on the side. Remember your chemical for your tank is going to go straight down into the toilet. This unit has that combination waste tank. So everything drains into one tank. On this one, I will specifically recommend that you tow it with the drain plug in the shower floor here, just to prevent any ickiness from accidentally splashing back into your shower. You've got a toilet paper cover right here that will keep your paper dry. And even though you've got a shower door, you've also got a shower curtain. Use the curtain to prevent water from leaking out of the shower and onto the main cabin floor. All right, guys, next we're going to have your wardrobe. In here, you'll find the awning tool, the, sta the stab jack crank, um, little cover for your sink. Over here, you've got your TV. The TV is on a travel bracket, so if you pull the strap down, you can pull it away from the wall. You'll notice a little plunger here meets with a little tab on the back of the TV. Make sure they're secure before you leave. Further over here, you've got a little black plate with a green, a green light. That is your antenna booster. When that green light is on, it's powering the omnidirectional antenna on the roof of the trailer. That antenna functions for the TV and also the radio. But we had the cable and satellite port on the outside. The cable port's already wired into the TV, but to get the signal to pass through, you must turn the booster off. There's a little black button. It's real hard to see. Just press that off. That will also allow the satellite signal to pass through the satellite port terminates up here where the radio is. Over on this side, we've got the inverter at the bottom. Touch this button, turn it on. Remember the inverter provides up to a thousand watts of alternating current to two plugs in this trailer. There is one plug up here in the radio area and another one over here by the television. Hold the button down to get the inverter to turn off. Not necessary to use this device if you're plugged into your shore service. Above that, we've got the bedroom light on its own dimmer. And then this is actually the bathroom light. And finally, the HVAC control. Now remember when the HVAC control panel is dark, the first press of any of the buttons just turns the backlight on. So you will end up pressing the buttons twice in a lot of cases. So once just to turn the backlight on and twice to power the unit. <clears throat> We're gonna use the mode button to cycle through the options. The first option is always gonna be that air conditioner. The Dometic ACs do not fire up immediately. It takes just a moment, you'll see a little hourglass appear. We'll hear the fan come on, and then usually within about a minute of that fan coming on is when we'll hear the air compressor kick in. So we're gonna wait for that.
Once the hourglass disappears, the air conditioner should be going. Now you'll notice down here we've got a fan symbol and an auto. That is the speed control. There are three speeds on your overhead fan and they're controlled by the fan button here. Low, medium, and high. Leave it in auto as the default. With the mode button, we've got the auto across the top. The auto across the top will automatically switch between the air conditioner and the heat pump, depending on your ambient temperature and what you've got the target temperature set for. The next option will be the heat pump. It makes a little squishy sound as it switches back and forth. After that, we'll have the furnace. Now, you'll notice as we switch to the furnace that the overhead unit stops and the furnace comes on down below. The furnace is actually located underneath the bed, right next to the wardrobe. It is a propane furnace, so you've got to have gas and you've got to have one of the bottles open. Even though the furnace is controlled through the same panel as the air conditioners, the furnace will run whether you're plugged into the shore service or not. It's 12 volt for its fan, propane for its heat source. The thing you want to remember is after you shut the furnace off, it runs for two more minutes to cool itself off. So do not turn the trailer off before that fan stops. After the furnace, we have a fan only option. That's the overhead fan without the air conditioner or the heat pump doesn't work on auto. So you must pick low, medium, or high to get that fan only option to work. Make sure you return that fan back to auto before you turn the unit off, cycle all the way through to off before you turn the control panel off so that way it doesn't accidentally come back on to whatever you had been using previously. Now as we come back out underneath the bed, we're gonna find the breaker and fuse box. Alternating current where the breakers are, DC or direct current where the fuses are. Now next to the fuses, you'll see a little red LED light that'll glow through the panel door. So if one of the fuses is out, you should be able to tell at a glance from across the room. All right, folks, the last thing we're gonna talk about is your fantastic exhaust fan. On off switch is gonna open the lid, turn the fan blade on. Remember, this is an exhaust fan. It's drawing air out of the unit. You wanna use this when you're cooking or showering to help with the heat and the moisture. If you guys are boondocking and you're not connected to the short service, you can actually open that bedroom window and turn this on and draw that cooler outside air across you guys and use it as an air conditioner. It's got a built-in rain sensor, so if it starts to rain, it will close on its own. When it closes on its own, it will shut itself off. Folks, do not tow the trailer with this door open. That lid is plastic and it will flap in the air and possibly cause some damage. That's gonna be it, folks. I really appreciate your time. Have a great day.